All right, welcome back. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at home labs and five things you can do with your home lab. And so actually like, as you dig into the home lab world, you'll find like the definition of what a home lab is, is kind of whatever you want it to be. And there's so much you can do with a, a computing environment with you where you can experiment and learn. And it can be a ton of fun. And actually like, I almost didn't get around to making this video today because I was playing with one of my home lab ideas and I was just so into getting it set up and trying to debug it. I haven't gotten it working quite yet that I almost missed putting this video together, but I was looking forward to making this video. So what we're gonna do is walk through five ideas for your home lab. Now, there's tons of content out there about home labs and the things you can do with them. And I think a lot of the content you'll find tends to be focused on applications you can run for home automation. So if you want to run a media server or do home automation with Home Assistant, there's a lot of great content out there. So I'm gonna take a slightly different approach and focus a bit more on kind of the learning and experimenting with different computing environments, et cetera. But before we jump into the examples, I think it would be good to start with defining what a home lab is. And since we live in the world where we don't have to think about anything, what I will do is I will just defer to ChatGPT and we will jump over here and ask the great brain of the internet what a home lab is. All right, that is a, a very long and complete definition. Short for home laboratory refers to a setup in a home environment where individuals can create their own computing, networking, or other technology infrastructure for various purposes, learning, experimentation, development, or personal projects. I don't know, when I was a kid, I just called this having a computer. That's okay, we have a formal term for it. Yeah, I think, it, I think people get a number of machines and play with different environments, operating systems, et cetera. And I really look at it as a place for learning and skill development, and you can make it whatever you want. But I will say, I think like the foundation of a good home lab is a, a solid virtualization environment. And you'll see that when we jump into these examples. Having something like Proxmox underlying your home lab, or if it's VMware, your favorite virtualization environment, just makes experimentation so much easier, so much faster. You can make mistakes, you can try things, you can try different operating systems, you can try all kinds of different things that if you were doing this with actual hardware, would be very time consuming and expensive. I'll tell you, in, in preparing for this video, I was playing around with TrueNAS. I saw that TrueNAS could do clustering. So I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I'm, again, instead of running off and making a video, I got distracted and started to build out a TrueNAS cluster, but I was able to do it in like 10 minutes by quickly setting up a bunch of VMs, getting TrueNAS running on them, and quickly finding I couldn't get it to work. And then I found out that clustering on TrueNAS isn't supported, but that was a few minutes of wasted time versus hours if I quickly, not quickly, if I had gone and kind of wiped a piece of hardware, et cetera. To me, like if you have uh, it available, uh, running a, a virtualization environment is really, really a, a great thing to do in a home lab. But with that, why don't we just jump in and run through these five ideas? And remember, this is just five. There's so much more. Uh, and when I'm done with this, if you, uh, if you like the content and you want me to kind of hit on some other ideas or you have some like, please drop them in the comments and we can, uh, we can take it from there. But let's just jump right in with idea number one, and that is running a high availability cluster. Now I have a bit of bias since I did just do a video on this. Here I have my, um, my Proxmox environment. <clears throat> and the cool thing about Proxmox, and I assume VMware and all the other kind of professional level uh, virtualization environments is they can run in high availability mode. So you could have several nodes running in your virtualization environment. The idea being if one goes down, your workloads and your virtual machines can quickly and seamlessly move over. I think, I don't know what, what the story is with VMware, but it, Proxmox wants a minimum of three machines to do that. I don't have three machines sitting around. I want to set a Proxmox on to try this. But again, this virtualization environment is a great place uh, to play around with this because you can run a hypervisor inside of a hypervisor. And what you saw in my video, and I'll, I'll put some of that up here on the screen, is inside of Proxmox itself, I ran three additional Proxmox instances, configured them into a high availability cluster, ran VMs inside of those, and was able to show 
and play with virtual machine migration. Now, was it a production environment or anything I would use beyond experimentation? No, not at all. It was a, a fun kind of afternoon of learning. I got to see how the high availability worked. And I think a lot of these become jump, jumping off points to try something else, or if you found it really helpful, you might wanna bring that into a physical environment. Kind of, I know personally stepping out of that experimentation, I was like, well, maybe I would set up an actual cluster of three physical machines if I had some extra time and, and found some hardware laying around. That was uh, idea number one. So with that, let's move to uh, idea number two for your home lab. That is playing with TrueNAS. So, you know, I'm kind of assuming that if you're, if you're watching this video, maybe you're somewhat new to the home lab space and you're learning and trying to figure out what to do. And maybe you got into this when you purchase something like a Synology. It seems like a, a pretty common entry point, but there are many other NAS options out there. And one popular piece of software is called TrueNAS. There are a number of people in the broader community who really, really swear by it and love the features TrueNAS offers. And I think some, if, again, if you look around different content creators, you'll see some people actually use both in for regular workloads. They'll use Synology for one set of things and then have a TrueNAS environment which is higher scale and they use it for things like video editing. But if you just want to play around with uh, TrueNAS itself and understand what the features are, see what uh, the interface looks like and what configuring it looks like, trying this in your home lab environment is super easy. So right here, I will just show you for fun. I uh, did start up a, a TrueNAS VM. So let's just jump over to this. Actually, so with TrueNAS, again, it's it's run through a web interface, so I just threw this together. So I'll show you real quickly. We'll jump over to... All right, so it's nothing special, but again, it, this is for learning and experimentation. I'll show you what I did. So here is the TrueNAS VM I set up, and uh, TrueNAS is running ZFS under the scenes, and I just added you know, three disks to it to play around. And then over here, on, I gave it a whole bunch of memory just for fun because ZFS loves uh, caching. And you can see I configured that. I set up a storage pool and I actually set uh, two of these drives up in a mirror configuration, but just for fun. Uh, so is this an awesome uh, production environment? No, 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 not at all. But if you want to try a different NAS to understand like its features, Again, really, really fun to set up TrueNAS. You can throw some fakish uh, drives at it. This is actually backed by a RAID array under the scenes, so it does have some redundancy. But again, this is super easy to set up and you could set up file shares, uh, play around with it and see how it works for you. So there you go, idea number two. All right, idea number three. Try a bunch of different Linux distributions. If we go back to we go back to ChatGPT, there's tons of articles on this, like what are the best There's so much out there and there's so many different Linux distributions catering to different needs. It it's fun to just grab a bunch of ISOs, set up VMs, and check out what's out there. Go find a few articles on this and see what you want to try, but I'll show you what I have set up. So I have Zorin, and I believe Zorin is uh, geared towards Windows users or a simplified interface. And again, under the scenes, when you when you open up a terminal and start to play with them, it's all very familiar. Here I have Manjaro, which is actually based on Arch. I looked up the pronunciation of this, Arch Linux. And so at least from what I've read, I haven't tried it, that the uh, installation and manage, installation of Arch Linux is, is pretty complicated. And Manjaro is designed to simplify that. But I actually really liked the interface of this, just playing around with it. Another, and personally, another interesting area for me has been uh, this concept of immutable Linux. And here I have, I've installed, a, this is immutable, it's called Kinoite, which is a derivative of Fedora. And this is using the KDE desktop. So before I jump into that, what is immutable Linux? And so again, I won't. Here we go. The context of Linux systems to refer to a configuration where the file system or certain parts of it are made read only. So these are interesting. 
Again, this is just a KDE desktop. It's nothing special, but you can't just update packages. You can't, you can't do installations, etc. It's a completely different process for updating the OS since most of the core operating system files are read only. So you can go read about immutable Linux, but again, you want to play with it. Maybe this is an environment you want to use for, you know, let's just say certain use cases. You want to try something sketchy. I don't know. You can go play around with immutable Linux, but that's another thing to try. And if you want to try a security focused uh, distribution, there's Kodachi, which has a set of se built in security services and security applications that frankly, I have not even started to scratch the surface of. And one of the really cool things is this distribution can be run exclusively in RAM. So once you shut it off, it's gone, no trace. Uh, this this probably is of the ones I played around with. This is the most unique and and might be worth spending a little time with. This looked like fun as well. So that wraps up where are we? I think that is idea number three. All right, number four. Try running your own firewall. You can see here on the screen behind me. I'm actually going through the configuration of PS PF Sense, which is a popular open source firewall along with OPN Sense. If you're new again, if you're new to the home lab environment, you probably have some type of like consumer firewall, or maybe you have a, a unified dream machine or something like that. But some people like to run their own firewalls on a custom piece of hardware and they'll run something like PFSense. If you wanna learn about PFSense, you can run it in a virtual machine. And actually I had it up and running prior to this, but I actually messed up the configuration. And this goes back to uh, the debugging I was doing at the beginning. You can, uh, you can run PFSense and create a virtual machine running a firewall right inside your Proxmox uh, virtualization environment. Then you can create a new network behind that firewall. You can put VMs behind it and you can kind of create this whole configuration of machines and learn what PFSense or OPN, OPN Sense can do, play with its interfaces and see if maybe that's a direction you wanna go. Um, I was just watching a really interesting video on uh, Dave's garage and I think Techno Tim also did a video on virtualizing your firewall a number of years ago. And what I found fascinating about uh, Dave's garage video, he has, I think, five gigabit symmetric internet. And he was finding that with packet inspection on his dream machine, it was actually not fast enough to keep up with that. So he offloaded the firewall work to a separate physical device. And I think he was running PFSense, not OPN Sense. But anyway, like setting this up and running it on a virtual machine would allow you to get familiar with it and see if it's a direction you want to go in the future or if you really if you want to move away from you know a kind of off the shelf piece of hardware you purchased and and run your own stuff now there's a number of other videos on this as well and what they tend to show is like how do you virtualize your firewall and actually use it as your firewall in a virtual machine what i'm showing here and I'll, i am going to make another video on this is how do you run a firewall inside your actual firewall and create another network behind it just for, for testing purposes? All right, number five, and finally. Uh, the last idea for your home lab, lab, I did it, I messed it up again. The last idea for your home lab is write, with, write some code or play with some open source project. There's so much code out there you can play with open source projects. You can gra grab the code for and play around with everything from operating systems. You can go grab the Linux kernel and compile it. And just as an example, sitting here on the window behind you is the Linux kernel compiling away, uh, pushing the 56 cores of uh, this Proxmox server to their max and making the closet behind me very warm. But you can you have everything from uh, operating system level code, or if you want it, try machine learning. You can go grab machine learning models, set up a Jupyter notebook, play around with all of that. There's so, so much to, to dig into and it's super easy so, since you can just clone many uh, projects right off of GitHub, try them out, try editing some code, seeing how they build, seeing how they work, maybe modifying them a little bit to your own liking and, and trying out different features. And like, again, you can try different dev environments as well. So if you have this home lab and this virtualization environment, you can try setting up a dev environment on Linux, you can run Mac OS or even Windows. That is uh, the final idea for your home lab is go grab some source code and have fun. And with that, we will wrap it up.
So once again, five ideas for your home lab environment. I hope you found that helpful. If you want to see more, let me know down in the comments if there's something you want me to dig into. Happy to do so, but I'd also love to hear other ideas from you. I do know like when I started to get into this, I would see threads on Reddit like, well, I just set up my home lab and I have a NAS up and running. What do I do now? And I think that answer is almost endless. And I and this is just, uh, like I said, five ideas in just the beginning. But throw some more ideas below and we will see you later.